last night was our first night sleeping in a van. And how did you, how'd you do? Two months traveling on the road, our home is where the traffic flows. We'll bring you everywhere we go and sleep in a freezing cold van because we're a little bit crazy, but you'll see that it's worth it. Good morning. As you can see, we are strolling into town today and we're gonna check out as much as we can in one day. Just casually walking through a beautiful Spanish town that I had never heard of until yesterday. <laughs> are here and the first thing we're gonna do is go to the Banos Arabes, uh, the Arab Bats, and they are that way. <laughs> Probably right there. customary for visitors from outside kingdoms to first visit the baths and go through this process so almost like in a religious process through the different steam rooms and it would be as religious a process as it is a social process it was just um, an introduction to the city these are the Arab or Muslim adaptations to the Roman baths. Uh, whereas the Roman baths, you would often just wade in water. Here, it's more likely that they would have been standing in steam rooms. The Muslim Medina of Ronda was at its most resplendent in the period in which the Nazarid kingdom of Granada, 13th century through 15th century, was, was the last Islamic stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula. Its strategic position between the Ka Castilian and Nazarid regions converted this city into the most western stronghold of the kingdom, and as such, it was an obligatory step in the relations between Granada and North Africa via the Strait of Gibraltar. Given this, the Sultan of Granada valued Ronda greatly, an importance that was reflected in its architecture. With palatial houses such as the Giant's House, and these baths, probably the best preserved in Spain. Welcome everyone. So we are now at the Puente Nuevo, which means the new bridge. And this new bridge was built in the 1700s. Very new, very new. think of Spain, one of the things that usually pops into your mind is bullfighting. And bullfighting is just, it's a traditional Spain, Spanish thing. And bullfighting actually originated here in Ronda. So this is the oldest bullfighting arena because it's the first one. And 
Well, Maddie and I don't particularly like the uh, Spanish method of bullfighting where the bull doesn't have a very good ending. This is, however, a very important historic site and it's the oldest bullfighting arena and still in use today. We've stopped for lunch. So we had a really awesome time here in Fronda. It's so incredible how this ancient town is built right on the edge of a cliff. And when Herbie says ancient, he means ancient. This town, there's evidence of human beings living here from the Neolithic era. And if you are like me and need explaining, that means end of the Stone Age. So between 10,000 BC and 4,500 BC. So pretty much when farming started, they were here. And this place is also inhabited by the Phoenicians, which if that rings a bell, it's because they invented writing. Because <laughs> this town is that old. So we're now on our way. Back to the van, back to Ginny. We're gonna see that evidence of the Neolithic people via ancient cave paintings. No. The magic of art. The oldest art. So it's really cool. We're walking along the old wall to the city and it's called Paseo Chefchaouen, which is like Chefchaouen Way, pretty much. Now the really cool thing is when we were traveling before, we stopped in Morocco, and in Morocco, we went to this ancient town called Chefchaouen, and it's the Blue City. And it was founded by people who fled from Spain from the Spanish Inquisition in the 1400s to Morocco to escape the Spanish Inquisition in the 1400s. And it makes you wonder, like, did those people possibly come from this area? And then when they got there, they then just named that place Chef Shawin as well, because that place was also a mountaintop, clifftop village with a wall around it. So there's some similarities. So it makes you wonder, are they related? So last night was our first night sleeping in a van. And how did you, how'd you do? Well, at first I was constantly worried because we hear cars rushing past that someone was going to hit us, like rear end us, and since we were sleeping right next to the back bumper, I was a little worried that I was going to get like hit to sleep. And then I just got really calm and just went to sleep and slept like a rock until morning. <laughs> so it was pretty good. It was freezing in the car, but we got these sleeping bags for below zero degree temperatures. And so we were like, we were completely oh, so warm. Yeah. yeah, we were both sleeping on the bottom bunk and between our bodies and the sleeping bags, we were totally happy and snuggly and fine. The only thing is that it's a really hard bed, but we'll get used to it. It was a short but very steep hike up to the caves. But the good news is we were able to slip in with the four o'clock tour because there are only two other people here. So we're really, really excited. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna go into those caves, but we can take lanterns, we cannot take the cameras. So, sorry guys. Here's what we saw. <laughs> this one was my favorite one. It's a pregnant horse. There's Ginny. <laughs> Those caves were absolutely incredible. So a couple things about them. Since we couldn't bring you in there with us, I have to explain that the cave paintings in there were all over the walls. The, and most of the walls were covered in cave paintings with charcoal. Those were done by humans 4,000 years ago. But even further back in time, we've got red paintings. And those were generally animals like horses and goats. They were made out of iron oxide mixed with animal fat. And that's actually how they can carbon date these paintings because they can use the fat from the animals as carbon. But the coolest paintings, in my opinion, were the ones made out of yellow paint. You can barely see them, 
but that's because they're 40,000 years old. 40,000 years ago, these human beings in the Neolithic period were grabbing terracotta and mixing that with animal fat to make these yellow pigments. The most obvious painting in the cave that was done with the terracotta was this bull, just a head with some horns, but it was very obviously a bull or an ox. The other really interesting thing about the caves was the walls were covered in black soot. And that was evidence of fires from the people who lived there, as well as these clay pots that they used uh, and some bones, both human and animal. So my favorite bone that I got to see there was the axis, which is the second vertebrae in your neck. And it's the one that has the odontoid process, which is the tooth in your spine. And it points up and then the atlas, which holds your whole head, sits and pivots on that tooth. So it gives you the at axis of rotation for your head. This. But the cool thing is that vertebrae is so distinguishable. And there was a pile of bones with that vertebrae sticking on it. Just the little tooth sticking up like, hi, I'm here and I've been here for about 20,000 years. So cool. Now I've always wondered with these cave paintings, is it that one guy one day decide, hey, I'm gonna draw something here. And a couple thousand years later, another guy's like, hmm, it's a cool bull. I'm gonna draw one right next to it. Like, like how, cause there's thousands of years between these paintings. And I wondered, is it that they just never did it and then seldomly did it? Or is it that these are the few that survived? And it turns out that they, and us too, we draw, everywhere on everything every single surface was drawn on the thing is thousands of years have gone by soot from chimney from fires has covered a lot of it you know mineral water has covered it stuff has damaged them so these are the ones that are left so pretty much anywhere there's a like a hollowed out area that has been safe and preserved over time the paintings in that area are safe and preserved as well and there's some really cool areas in there where they've like the whole area is just preserved and it's just all covered in all these drawings all over the place. It's so neat. The black paintings, the ones done with charcoal, we can see uh, records of timekeeping, which is really cool. There's two types of calendars. Uh, there's the lunar calendars, which is just a straight line with a bunch of tick marks on it, eight or seven. And the reason for the horizontal ones was they believe for agriculture, for farming, to keep track of the months. So one tick mark for every full moon in the series. And then there's this kind of triangle with ticks coming off of it. And there are nine of those. And they believe that those represent the gestation period for a woman. So we had an amazing time here. We highly recommend it. They're, They're called the Cuevas de la Pileta. And they are well worth the stop. So apparently the bats come out at sunset because they're bats <laughs> and sunset isn't that far away so we're actually going to just hang out in the van in the van for a while like a bunch of creepers and wait for those bats to come out and we're gonna look at them well the sun is setting about now so we are we're ready for the bats we're, we're totally ready we got the cameras ready we're standing near the hole that we think they fly out of <laughs> Maybe, hopefully. But apparently you can see them from like a whole bunch of different areas. So I just really want to see them come out of the ground because that'd just be so cool. Today I don't feel like doing anything. I'm a hang around in my cave. <laughs> so the sun has set. No bats yet. Wait, you were recording that? Yes. <laughs> Them bats ain't out yet. And it's getting really dark, really dark. I just don't think we're gonna be able to see the bats. Yeah, I'm worried. They come out. Yeah, it'll just be more black on black in the dark night sky, and we'll be like, hmm. Wonder when they'll come out. <laughs> Stand here till morning, bats. see them come back in. Come on, bats. We're waiting. Well, it's 7 30, and it's pitch black outside, so even if the bats did come, we wouldn't be able to see them. Guess no bats for us. Nope. Really wanted to see Batman's cave. We saw his cave. We just didn't see his little minions. Yeah. It's not the same. 
Tonight we dine on sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, so no bats. So then we decided, this is a nice place. <laughs> we'll just uh, sleep here because it's really quiet. It's like off on some random side road and nobody's around. So I think uh, we'll be safe here for the night. Yeah, so we just, uh, we turn the van around so that way in the morning we can just, you know, drive straight out. Or if anything spooks us, or just whatever. We just head straight, we can get to the main road. But otherwise, Maddie's making dinner. And I converted our bicycle storage area into a dining room table. Yay. Because that's what a dining room looks like in a van. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the bikes are literally just outside leaning up against the truck. We don't have bike locks yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we bought the bikes and they came with bike locks, but they did not come with keys to the bike locks. We're having tomato, cheese, and uh, prosciutto. I don't know why I have to say prosciutto the like pompous way. Pompous way, but yeah. uh, there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bon appetit. So we're just gonna sit here, watch Outlander, because we're uh, addicted mm. to that show. It's so good. We just started it, and it is absolutely amazing. Oh, it's not amazing, but it is really good. I think it's amazing. We're finishing off our dinner with some wine and cheese. And this is port wine that we got when we were in Porto, traveling through the Duro Valley. Uh, we went to this vineyard and it was just a really nice experience. So we decided to bring it with us on the van trip, especially since it keeps really well after it's opened. You only need a little bit because they're about 20% alcohol volume. And like classy people, we drink wine out of coffee cups. These are the only cups we brought. <laughs> morning everyone so we are just warming up the van I'm gonna get it warmer that way it's not a ice cube in here it's currently nine degrees centigrade or Celsius I don't exactly know what that is in Fahrenheit but it is quite cold so we're gonna get it warmed up so that way Maddie will come out of her sleeping bag so where's our next stop all right, now we're going to make a quick stop at Setanil de las Bodegas. It's one of the 20 white towns in the mountain range that we're in, which is the Ronda mountain range, which cuts right through Andalusia. And then we're going to head on to a pit stop in Portugal to figure out some bank stuff <laughs> before heading to Madrid. Yeah, so apparently banks in Europe do not care that they're all part of the EU and all part of the same company. Each country is its own bank and you can do nothing if you're not in that country. So all our banks are in Portugal. So to Portugal we go. But first, Setanil de las Bodegas. Yes.
we came here because Maddie saw pictures on the internet and it was this awesome cute little town built into the side of a cliff. Found it! This is what this town is famous for. It's a street that goes under and is built straight into a cliff. So they're not really sure of the origin of this town, but it does probably date back to prehistoric times, uh, which means that people have been living in these cliff faces uh, before they were caves, now they're homes, with their own microclimates inside uh, for thousands and thousands of years. It's really a gift that we were able to come to this town. It's not well known at all, and I only heard of it because I saw a Facebook post in a group called Amazing Places that I'm part of, and I kind of used it as a little bit of a checklist for this trip. It's been so worth the twisty, twirly, windy, whirly drive to get up here into these cliffs, mountains, and, and orchards. It's just... We're up here on the tower, which is the highest point of the town right now, and it's beautiful. That was a beautiful stop in Setanil de las Bodegas, but now we have to head to the Portuguese border <laughs> uh, to figure out that bank stuff we were talking about earlier. So just a short little detour. Hey, by the way, we're spending our Valentine's Day driving six hours. That all the way across the ocean in Puerto Rico when I grew up, we heard about Toledo because they made the best swords. Uh, so we're here with Mariano Zamorano who is the last sword maker in Toledo, of the original sword makers of the Toledo Steel. Okay, today we are off to the uh, old city of Madrid. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And if you'd like to follow our journey in real time on a map, receive postcards from our ports of call, and message us directly to the boat, you can go ahead and become a patron using the link in the description down below.